Uh, thank you, Eric. Shalom, everyone. Uh, so I was two weeks ago, uh, first Gian, uh, invited speaker in uh, the University of Mumbai in Kalina campus up in Santa Cruz. And it was a memorable experience. I taught there for two weeks, brilliant students of uh, that university. But I want to share with you something else. Uh, on my last day in Mumbai, was uh, I, they took me to KC College downtown. And I gave a talk about a project which I was the project coordinator of. And it was about uh, the first Israeli astronaut mission on the space shuttle Columbia. And on that mission, we also had Dr. Kalpana Chawla, which was an uh, India-born astronaut. And I told the story of that mission, which I was uh, uh, the project manager of, uh, to uh, young students of that Indian campus. And uh, I was greeted by uh, the chan vice chancellor of Mumbai University, Professor uh, Sanjay Deshmukh. And he told me, listen, I'm going to be only for the first 15 minutes, I apologize, I have to go to another meeting. But uh, my talk was probably so interesting, so he stayed until the end. And the students that were in the audience, they all wanted to take selfie pictures with me at the end of the talk. And they asked me so many brilliant questions uh, that I thought, OK, these guys are really, really up. And, and they are eager and curious. And I was really impressed by the level of, of that college students and also by my students at, uh, at the University of Mumbai. And it, it really is uh, fascinating. And I was telling Eric and also Professor Reichmann that we should really, we, the IDC, and certainly my school, uh, you know, strengthen our ties with Indian universities like exchange programs or maybe through the Gyan uh, um, apparatus send uh, lectures to you uh, in India to share and learn from each other. I learned a lot in those two weeks uh, about Mumbai uh, and what Nati had told me and he just briefly described uh, in his talk was I experienced this firsthand. It was really an eye-opener for me and I already have uh, things uh, in my mind to talk about. But, so this is just the beginning. I know it's very hard to keep you awake at 4 o'clock. And I really feel for you. you. You came here early in the morning, and you, uh, you hear continuous lectures. Most of them are very, very interesting and relevant. And it's really hard to stay alert. Uh, and I realized that. By the way, I was at the food tech um, meeting here in Israel two days ago. And so this was about food and innovation in food. Israel has a very vibrant startup food industry. Uh, and, and there is an accelerator. And one of the guys there showed uh, uh, something that they developed to overcome the tiredness, the after lunch tiredness. And I told this guy, so it's just a, some liquid. You take that and you suddenly feel fresh. And I said, hey, you should bring this to my university. You know, all my students will buy this in tons because we know that, <laughs> and you probably know this so well, there's the post-lunch slumber that students tend to lose you and, and drift off. And so if you just give this magic uh, biological, I don't know, it kind of looks like water but tastes like sugar, but it was good. I took a sip and I stayed awake. So I should have brought maybe a little bit, and hopefully coffee did that. So I'm going to talk about something completely different, uh, which is about where our world is going. And I want to start with something that uh, Ban Ki-moon of the UN had said uh, in a message some months ago. He said, we have no plan B. And he was referring to planet Earth. We have no plan B. We have to fix the planet. And also, uh, Pope Francis had said that in a message uh, a year ago to the Catholic Church that we have to fix the Earth because it's God's garden, which he gave us. And so I'm going to show you what poor work we have done so far, and maybe show you trends and things that we need to, to be aware of, because our world is changing. I think you know that. But let me give you some, some numbers. I'm, I come from atmospheric physics. And uh, uh, so what we do is we observe the atmosphere. And I think you know those graphs already 
uh, actually I got this morning the newest one from NASA, and it tells the story of how uh, our planet is gradually warming, and, and if you compare it to the pre-industrial uh, era, there is no doubt that we are getting warmer. Of course, not equally around the planet. I will show you that it's, it's not everywhere the same, but certainly our world is becoming warmer. This is the latest compilation of data from, uh, from NASA satellites and from also reconstructions that they did. And you can see based, uh, on the baseline is the average temperature between um, the 1960s and the 1990s. And this is how they compare the value. So you see there are some natural fluctuations, but if you look at the red, red are above average, certainly most of the 21st century is above average and we're getting warmer and warmer. And as I said, it's not equal all over the planet. So this is a compilation, the latest one from last July. And you can see that most of the planet is warmer than average. So the, the darker the red, it's highest temperature it is. It's above average, much above average. And there are only very few regions on the planet which are cooler than average. And this was July. And 2016 is going to be the hottest year on record since we began measurements. So there may have been uh, warmer years in the past, but if you look at this continuation, certainly we are facing a warmer and uh, different climate altogether. And this has, of course, immediate consequences on life on this planet and life in the cities and the economy of countries. Uh, just to show you one immediate consequence is the rising of sea level because two things occur. The polar ice is melting. I will show you soon how fast. And th the level of the water is, not in is increasing not only because of this surplus of water that's coming in, but also because warmer water occupy more volumes. It just expand a little bit. And you can see this is a, a record of the sea level, average sea level around the planet from the uh, 19th century, pre-industrial, until today. So you may say, hey, 25 millimeters, that's not so, you know, so bad. Uh, 25 centimeters, sorry. That's not very much, but this is going to continue for 100 years or 200 years. And slowly the water level is rising. Now, uh, many, many countries actually are at sea level. Take, for example, your neighbor country, Bangladesh. Bangladesh is facing a severe flooding if the Indian Ocean keeps getting higher. And already we know that some islands in the Pacific are below water, below sea level. So that's going to be uh, a, a tremendous problem to many, many nations. We're going to face climate refugees, not like political refugees that Mike referred to, which are occurring anywhere. And I will show you that these things are related either directly to the fact that the land is submerged in water or to other problems that, that we'll face. And this is a strict, I mean, this is a, you cannot argue with the facts. Some, some of you may have heard the term climate skeptics and deniers, but I don't argue anymore. I just show pictures. You show the ice in the Arctic in, the, uh, in 2012 and in 1984. The difference is clear. Now the Northern Passage is open, so you can have shipping lanes from the West, the Eastern United States to China, which go around the pole. Instead of going through the Panama Canal, and anyway, so you, sh you shorted the, the, the commerce merchant lines by a huge amount. Uh, and it opens, of course, economic possibilities, but this is bad news for the environment and for those people living in that region. So ice is getting down and uh, we are looking at trends in precipitation because we see this is a complex graph. Don't look in the details. It's taken from the IPCC report, but it shows that the differences in temperature are translated to differences in precipitation, but it's not working the same everywhere. So for example, India is very dependent on the monsoon. And, and two weeks ago, it's already post monsoon and just a little number of rainy days, but uh, I talked to my students, they said it was a normal average monsoon, which is good news. 
for India in terms of water and agriculture. But in the future, we forecast changes in the strength of the uh, Indian and uh, Southeast Asia monsoon, which will have grave consequences for drinking water and for agriculture. And we need to know that in advance, so it's not going to happen tomorrow, but 20, 40 years from now, this is where we are headed. And we already see this desertification trend and one of the most vulnerable uh, areas on the planet that faces this is the Middle East. The Middle East and the North Africa region. So what uh, one of the speakers before told about the potential of the NEMA, the North Africa Middle East, in terms of high-tech industry and okay, economical development, but we also face a grave danger uh, of, of drought and lack of water. And if you look at the index of severity of droughts, you will see that there are many regions that are inflicted by severe and continuous droughts, which means lack of water, lack of drinking water for agriculture and for the people who will live in the cities Nati and Mike were talking about. So this is going to be a huge problem. And uh, let me focus a little bit on my region, and we already see this. It's not in the distant future. This is already now and here. Uh, if you look at this map, uh, southern Europe and the entire uh, Middle Eastern basin is suffering continuous droughts. Look at the upper graph. You can see the red. The red is below average years or drought. Israel is very dependent on precipitation, used to be. But I think uh, 12 or 13 years ago, our late prime minister, Ariel Sharon, had decided we're not going to rely on climate anymore because he was a farmer. He understood trends. And he didn't listen to these experts who said, but it's going to be costing so much to distill water. And they said, OK, Israel is going to start desalination of water. And we have now five huge desalination plants along the coast, which actually render us uh, you know, independent of what climate brings us. We used to be totally dependent. Now we're not. Uh, and so if you look at the index of droughts, and let me just tell you one story. It's the Levant. Take a look at the uh, right-hand most graph and the brown color. Brown colors means less rain than average. And you can see that also Greece and southern Spain are also in problem. And, and they're going to face huge problems in the future. And so this is, I took, don't look at the details. It's a paper about the Fertile Crescent, Iraq, Syria, northern Tur uh, southern Turkey, Lebanon, and Israel. It used to be the Fertile Crescent from Biblical times, rich in water, in agriculture. It's not fertile anymore. It's becoming a desert. And in that paper, Kelly et al. suggests that the actually collapse of Syria and the, the, the trouble there is due to the fact that there was continuous dr droughts that actually toppled agriculture. Farmers moved into the cities. The price of bread rose up and uh, civil unrest and geopolitical collapse. So it's all related. You see, climate change drives geopolitical changes, which in turn afflict countries. Now, what holds the future for us? So it all depends on how we behave. You know, it's like uh, if you try to uh, educate your, your children, uh, carrot or stick, I don't know how you say it. But uh, so either a prize a good future or a penalty, a terrible future. It depends on us. And that's what I think Ban Ki-moon and the Pope were referring to. And I think most of world leaders now realize this, that it depends on what we do. The heritage we leave to our children and grandchildren and grand-grandchildren is determined by the acts and decisions we take today. This is sustainability, not looking after yourself, but looking for future generations. So uh, we haven't done a good job so far, and we need to take a closer look. So it all depends on emission scenarios. This is the, if we, I, I wouldn't go into details, but you know greenhouse gas concentrations are rising, and today we got the latest message from NASA. It's, we've now passed the 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, and it's going to stay permanent. This is going to be the lower threshold, and we are going to keep rising. And how much depends on how we run our industry, how we run our cars, how we run our power plants. And so definitely 
if you run the models, the climate models, the number crunching that we are doing now, and every, every uh, respectable research university has at least one climate model that it's running. Uh, so the, the uh, representative concentration pathways, it's just this you know, elaborate name of saying how much greenhouse gases we're going to emit into the atmosphere, different scenarios reflecting different economical development scenarios. Are we going to rely on solar and renewable energy or are we going to burn coal like crazy, like China is doing? But China is sl slowly changing as well. So it all depends on, on what we will do. This will be the heritage we will leave future generations. If we curb down greenhouse gas emissions, we will not stop warming completely. It's too late, but we can maybe stop it at a reasonable level of 1.5 to 2 degrees by the end of this century. I don't want to think about the nightmarish scenarios of warmer than 2 degrees by 2100. We won't be here by 2100, but our grandchildren will be. And it all depends on what we do, what world they will be living in. Will it be this scenario, which is that 4.5 is not so good anyway, or this hell 8.5 uh, RCP uh, scenario. And in terms of precipitation, as I said, it's not a linear system. Climate is complex. Climate is hard to work with. But if you look at the different scenarios, 2.6, 4.5, which portray this uh, additional greenhouse gas emissions by us, rains will be different. And what makes me sad is that no matter what scenario you're looking at, uh, if I look at my little neighborhood, we get dry and warmer in each scenario. So definitely the Middle East is suffering and will suffer in the future. And in some scenarios, well, India gets more rain, good for you, but, but the Middle East is not, is not uh, getting better. So uh, it's, a, it's a huge serious for us. Uh, problem for us. Uh, if I look at the severity of natural disasters, we know in warmer climate we will get stronger storms, stronger and prolonged heat waves, and uh, additional um, extreme events. It's just that the average is moving, and you can look at this is schematic view. Uh, the future will get hotter and hotter. Sea ice will probably disappear altogether by the end of this uh, century. And it also bears on the uh, water supply in India in terms of uh, the ice on the Himalaya, which uh, you probably s rely, I mean, the major rivers draw waters from the ice water melting in the Himalaya. If you have no snow in the Himalaya, big problem in the future. Uh, so sea level will rise. I like this cartoon because it says you don't need to really try hard to get this fisherman, the water will rise and we will get him anyway. But it's, it's not a joke. I mean, it's not a joke. For some, as I said, some places it's already uh, hard. So if I look at the Mediterranean again, all those graphs are from capital cities in our region and the red part shows it's all going to get hotter. Now, if you think about this in terms of air conditioning and uh, energy requirements and even sustainability of life in cities that gets hotter and hotter uh, by the decade, it's going to get tougher. And um, I'll skip this. If you talk about water availability, this is a projection uh, for the next 50 years. You see that all the, the Levant is getting less and less rain by huge amounts. That's 20% or 30% less rain in the winter. Uh, but notice how this guy got the maps wrong. He put the West Bank in Lebanon and the Gaza Strip in Tel Aviv. So, I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs> Eric is telling me to stop. So, uh, some things that uh, the future holds for us is more dust storms because the ground is getting drier, not enough rain, and we will get dust outbreaks which affect uh, human health and uh, human conditions, and we will get more... Um, Forest fires, of course, in Israel, not large forests, but this is from Greece uh, two years ago. Uh, they lost the entire tourist season because of fires 
in the summer, and this is also in the future. So um, sorry to be not bearing good news, but the severity of this uh, future depends on us. And so let me summarize. So our region, the Mediterranean, is really vulnerable to climate change, which is already happening. It's not in the future. This is already taking place now. Uh, the drying and warming trends will result in severe damages to uh, agriculture. So we need to come, and this is what Israel is doing, come up with new uh, plant species that are drought tolerant, maybe can deal with less water and more salinity in the soil. Israel is very famous about that. And actually, when I was in India two weeks ago, I met Israel's uh, agricultural attache, and he told me that we have, with you guys, huge amounts of projects in rural India on, on farming, improving the yield of crops. And uh, so severe weather events will also be uh, more uh, frequent. And trends are unlikely to reverse. I can say will not reverse, for sure. But we may be just lowering a little bit the amplitude. So the future holds a lot of dangers for us, but also opportunities, because uh, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention. And we need inventions to tackle those problems. And I'm sure that your younger generation and our younger generation of students, entrepreneurs, scientists will solve those problems because the human race is inventive. Thank you very much.